Good evening and welcome once again. <laughs> well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever and wherever this may find you. I took your line, didn't I? No. <laughs> Glad you guys have joined us today. Cameron is just off camera there. Say hi, Cameron. That's it. Cameron the cat. We're in part 50 tonight, guys. Where do we go from here? Welcome to join us if you want to, Cameron. All right. Yeah, come on in. He's waffling. He's waffling. He's a waffle. He's an English waffle. Part number 50 here. Where do we go from here? Eschatology, eschatology touches upon a variety of topics. Now that we have completed the study, we must ask, where do we go from here? How do we apply the Great Commission? Should we be so heavenly focused that we are no earthly good? Should we live in fear of what may come? Should we be optimistic about the future? Perhaps we should be more focused on living godly lives rather than being stressed about today's headlines. Should we live in fear of what may come? Should we be optimistic about the future? Should we be more focused on living godly lives? Than this should be deja vu. Wow, I just said that. I was like, did I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how we live this out because Christ has left us here and he's left us here for good reason. Right. We're going to be about his kingdom. Uh, and we don't know all the details of Christ's second coming, when it's going to be, uh, what it's going to look like exactly. Within our lifetimes, we don't know. But we know that while we're here, we'll be busy. And Paul gives us some very explicit details, instructions, what to do uh, as a Christian. You ever ask yourself, what's my calling in life? What am I called to do? Right. Because people want to know, is it some mysterious thing you got to figure out? Uh, do I go to some guru, some mystic somewhere to, to tell me the answers to what right. I should be doing in life? Do I pray hard enough that God opens the doors and shows? I think Paul tells you what to do uh, in your life. I uh, just give you some principles here. Right. So if Amen. you're a wife, Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. So this, obviously, to married women, if you're a woman and is married, submit to your husband. Love him, serve him, uh, take care of the needs of the home. That is your calling in life. It's not some mysterious thing. Now, could you do other things in addition to that? Of course, well, you yeah. could have a sewing circle with some friends. You could evangelize your neighbors. There's a lot of things you could do as a wife, but uh, but it's pretty clear. If you're married, be faithfully married and take care of the household. That's right. So how are wives to live uh, to live in relationship to their husbands? They are to submit to the authority of their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Mm -hmm. And that look, could look different from right. to household. It could look, right. look different right. relationships for sure. That doesn't mean the wife's, you know, a doormat. Obviously, at my house anyway, uh, my wife has a better grasp on math and uh, those kinds of things. She's organized. I'm not. So she takes care of the bills, and I love her for it because if it was up to me, I don't know. I'd hate <laughs> she, to think about it. She has a good skill set. That's right. Yes. I think that your gifts and relationships should complement each other. Yes. And the husband shouldn't necessarily keep the checkbook if he's not good at, at yeah. the finances. Right. Amen. I agree 100% <laughs> with that. So if you're a wife, your submission to your husband look, might look different. Uh, nobody expects, uh, I don't think this text says that the wife has to meet you at the door with your slippers and a cigar <laughs> right. and a brandy and right. have a meal on the stove. And, you know, that's not what this text right. is about. It, right. Marriage is a partnership, and we are submitting to each other in this sort of Amen. a thing. So if you're a wife, if you're married, you're a lady, be faithfully married and take care of the duties within the home that you're expected to. It doesn't mean you right. can't work outside the home, but you just have to do what God has called you to do. Right. Now, if you're a husband. Ah. Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. <coughs> Excuse me. For years, um, for about 10 years, I led a domestic violence offenders group here in, in the county. I saw men go through that group um, from all walks of life. All The only thing they... Had it, the, the thing they most had in common was that they had offended uh, and used physical violence against their wife mm. or intimate partner. 
girlfriend, whoever. And they ended up in the court system. And this group was a diversion program to keep men from spending time in the jail that they completed this program six months every Monday night uh, for a two hours, two hour group was to sit around and I had literature and it was to go around in this group. And I, <clears throat> the men in the group love to quote the first part of Ephesians <laughs> here, wives yeah. submit to your husbands. Yep. He's the head of the household. Right. But I'd say, you know, you need to keep word, Paul's words in context because if you read a little bit further down, he doesn't just tell the wives what to do. He tells the husbands what to do. He said, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Right. He loved the church, his bride, so much he laid his life down for her. And if you love your wife that much, you wouldn't assault her. Right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't physically injure her. You wouldn't uh, put her down, emotional abuse. All right. those things wouldn't happen if you love your wife like, you, like Christ. And in fact, no lady would have any trouble submitting to their husbands if he loved her that way. Right. So our duty as a husband is to love our wife so much that her submission doesn't feel like submission. That's right. It's a, it's a joy and a privilege. Now, I'm not sure how the authority looks like in every home where this is played out, but I do know what love looks like. And if you love your wife, like Christ loved the church, then boy, it would be no be no chore at all, no burden at all. Yeah. How much does Christ love you? Well, God demonstrated His love for us that while well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that's what Christ has done for His church. And so, if something that we love, then we will cherish it and take care of it, protect it, and even give our lives for it. That's right. Paul said, he who loves his wife loves himself. So it's mm. important that we love our wives as much as or more as we love ourselves. Yeah. Uh, when an intruder comes in the house, it's our job to get up and answer that call in the middle right, of the night to right. protect the family. Take the bullet for the family or give one in some cases. If you <laughs> right. have to. Right. I hope it's not an even trade. And if your wife's a better shot than you, then I don't know. You know. You just at least <laughs> equip her anyway. You know. <laughs> She's got your back. Yeah, you, you believe in equipping the saints, it sounds <laughs> like. I agree 100%. <laughs> But it is our job as husbands, if we can, unless you're disabled or whatnot, to right. provide for your wife, protect your wife, right. love your wife, and all those sort of duties. Right. And I would say, um, not to swerve off into a lot of you know counseling type issues, but uh, emotional protection is important too. Um, being in a relationship with your spouse, being uh, emotionally supportive, not causing a lot of stress in her life, doing things that would irritate her or something like that. Try to alleviate that as much as you can. I mean, we're, none of us are perfect. We all have little ticks that rub each other raw sometimes, but uh, overall, a husband really needs to set the emotional uh, pattern in the home as well. Absolutely. How are husbands to, to love, I says live their wives, love their wives at the typo. <laughs> uh, like Christ, love the church and gave himself for it. Now, if you're listening and you happen to be a child, someone who's under the age of 18, you live in the parents' care of their home, Paul didn't overlook you either That's because right. in the early church, uh, just like churches today, there were husbands and wives. Uh, we see the um, Philippian jailer when he comes to Christ. Right. He, he brings Paul and Silas into to his home. He baptizes them. They share the gospel with the family, and the Bible says his whole family comes to Christ. Right. And we got to assume, though it doesn't say explicitly, that there's probably kids in that home. So this is written to believing children. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Obey, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right. So when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, this is the first one that has a promise attached to it. Right. If you do this, I will do that. Right. If you honor and care for your parents until their elderly dying days, then God will take care of you. That, yeah. That's an obligation we have. We've lost that to some degree oh in our culture. Yeah. We, we take, and I know the circumstances are, could be different in people's lives, but we take the elderly and push them into a, a nursing home where they don't want to be because we say, well, the state will take care of them. Mm. whatever right and so I think that's the disservice now they can live happy full lives in nursing homes there right. are good nursing homes out there uh, but the idea is that you're this is an obligation we have on going with the parents right. and it might look different depends upon where your parents live and right. their state of health and that sort of thing exactly right now this these few verses here speak to the kids obey your parents right before we go to the second part of this verse which is verse the second part of this command which is our father's duties right let's look at the first part of this with a little sure. detail here if you grow up in a home where your parent and your believing Christian child, and you happen to be saved 
Maybe you've heard the gospel at Vacation Bible School or you came to faith in Christ some other way. Mm -hmm. And your home is not a, not a believing Christian home. These duties still apply to you yes, as well. Yes, good point. But the, the but we draw the line if the parents um, coerce you to do something that is against God. Right. So if you're in a if you're a Christian child in an unbelieving parent's home, it is your job to obey that unbelieving parent, that pagan parent, to brush your teeth, to take a bath, to do your chores, to go to school, to all the right. things you expect to do. Up until or if that parent commands you to do something that's un un ungodly or against, right. the, against the moral commands of God. Right. At that point, you, you have God's permission to not obey them. Right. Because there are two laws, there are kind of two laws at stake. There's the laws of the land, which we're allowed to obey, mm -hmm. and there's the laws of God. Right. And while this is in <clears throat> Scripture, and these are moral decrees of Scripture, the higher law is that we should not place our parents' affection, pa affection for our parents above that of God. Right. If you find yourself a believing Christian child in a home that is um, part of a Christian subcult, mm. and they drag you down to the Kingdom Hall for mm. worships, you have to go. If you're not, if, right, you can't resist going to that. Um, you may be a situation where you're too young to be left home alone. You may have right. to go to those situations. You kind of figure right. this thing out. Right. You don't have to serve the God or believe the things that they do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, this is gets kind of sticky, right? Uh, it's uh, it's not. Like as likely in the first century, you had believing Christians in homes of parents that were not Christians, but it can happen. It does happen. I'm it sure does. Of that. You bet. And there's there's a tension there that uh, we have you have to figure out. I hope it's not you, but when you become 18 and can move out of your parents' house, then you can faithfully serve Christ, and the right. duties change a little bit. And there. obviously, if your parents are unbelievers and you, as a child, are are a believer, you, you you still love your parents. You know, you don't hate your parents. You want your parents to be saved too. And part of your love for your parents, demonstrating your love for your parents, is to obey them. And now the second applies to fathers, oh, you not see this mothers. A lot. You yeah. see this a lot. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. So right. do not provoke your kids to anger. Do not pick at them. Do not crush their spirits. Right. Do not be uh, unfair or too harsh in your discipline of them. Uh, don't... Don't crush their spirits, mold their spirits, right? right. right. Uh, you know, people uh, want to raise kids like they raise horses. They want to break their spirits and then <laughs> and then make them. Right. Remember years ago uh, that the horse whisperer was very popular. Remember the horse I remember, whisperer? I remember, I remember. And this man, not, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I remember people talking about it. He would, he would demonstrate his method of getting a horse to submit to his will, um, not by the way that we Westerners do by... Uh, riding on a horse to submits <laughs> to us or whipping the horse or mistreating the horse or putting a small pin and harassing the horse until it just exasperated gives into our will he, he studied the the ways the native americans would would get horses to submit to their will and if i if i remember right his technique was if there was a particular horse he wanted to train to make it a horse he could ride he would isolate that horse from the herd the rest mm -hmm. of the herd he would he would branch that horse off to be by itself and the herd to go over here and feed. And anytime the horse tried to join the herd, he would hit it off and keep the horse deterred from joining the herd. And he would, and he said it would, it could, in, out while he was training these horses, it could be miles and miles of prairies out west mm -hmm. somewhere. So he could drive these horses for 20, 30 miles and keep the horse, keep the horses moving and keep this, this wayward horse away from the group. Now, as animals, horses want to be, they're social animals. Right. They want to be around other horses. It's not good to have a horse. You want to have at least two horses, right? You, of course, horses are social animals. And so this horse wants to join the herd, but and in t but the man wouldn't let him until the horse submitted. says that he could do this. He could keep this horse, pester the horse enough, keep it away from the herd enough. But the horse eventually says, I'm not going to beat, th this man's going to out-stubborn me. And eventually the horse would, would submit to the man. He could go and put a saddle on him. And he never had to whip the horse or be coarse with the horse mm -hmm. or anything like that. And the man would demonstrate this technique, the horse whisperer. There's a movie about this. Yep. He would get a stadium and he would have like a rodeo setting. And he would have somebody bringing a horse that's never been ridden before. That's mm -hmm. wild and a buck, you know, just to be just wild. And he, he would demonstrate within a half an hour as he was talking this out, mm -hmm. how to get this horse to submit to him, to put a saddle on him and to ride him. And the way to do it is not to just throw the saddle on the horse and ride it to the horse exasperates. Right. 
or you get injured yourself, but it's to wear the horse down. It's to mold and to, to, to discipline the horse in a way that's not physically harmful. Right, right. I use that analogy because I think it's a good analogy when it comes to uh, this verse here. Fathers, don't unnecessarily provoke your kids. Don't crush them with your anger. Right. Don't be overly critical or harsh of them. Uh, there's a way to mold a child's spirit to encourage them without crushing them. That's, that's right. Amen. I, I don't know what else to say there. No, I mean, it's pretty much covered it all. But you sure see it a lot because, you know, some dads think to be a dad, you've got to be in control. You've got to be, you know, super strict or firm. And I know uh, we were, you know, maybe too strict at first trying to figure out, you know, boundaries and what can we do, can't we do, should we do, shouldn't do. And uh, you don't want to crush them. You want to let them, you want to let them flourish a little mm-hmm. and who God made them to be. And of course, uh, praying for their salvation always. But yeah, you see a lot of dads that for whatever reason, uh, they make their kids angry with their parenting. I'm never going to parent my kids like that. Yeah. <laughs> when I get to be in a, get to be 18, I'm leaving this house and never coming back. Yeah. But those are words spoken by a child who's been crushed by a parent, for whatever right. the case would be. Right. Pastors don't do that. But instead, instead of doing that, do this. Bring them up with, with discipline. Discipline is not a bad word. No, no. In fact, the root of discipline is disciple, isn't it? Right. It's, a disciple is one who's disciplined, who, who studies under the master, right? Right. So, as fathers, our job is to be in charge of the spiritual care yeah. of our kids. That right. means bringing them to church when the doors are open, having them involved. It means to uh, model how Christ, the love of Christ right. to our kids. That's it, the most important thing. And now, when they get to be old, they might run away for a little while, but it is it is the hope and prayer of parents that they will come back. Yes, yes. So if you're a child and you probably, you know, you're listening to this, uh, Paul would say to you, live where you are in honor of your parents, obey them, and uh, live in submission to them. It's God's will for your life. Now, Paul doesn't stop with wives and husbands and kids. He goes on to other relationships like employees and employers. Yes, yes. Turn to Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rending, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does... This he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. All right, thank you. You bet. So we see two two classes of people, the employee and the employer. Now, Paul uses phrases like masters and bondservants because slavery was an accepted practice, a cultural right. practice of the first century. Uh, we don't have slavery in this world, but this is a close parallel to employment and employer right. and employee. Certainly the principle does apply. Yeah. If you are employed somewhere, it is your God-given responsibility to work yeah. for that boss, Walmart, the gas station, Yep. Uh, wherever you work, to work as though Christ is your employer. That's right. It, it makes you can get through a long day a lot better that way. Yep. If in your mind you're saying, "I'm working for Christ. This is you know how I can worship Christ and glorify Him," it is by doing my job and being uh, having a good attitude about it. You know, not threatening the boss, not talking about the boss, but jumping in there as if you were working for Christ Himself. Yeah. Ultimately, Christ is our master, yes. and He is our Lord, and He's Lord over our bosses on this earth. Hey, that's right. And whatever job that's lawful that God has given you, it is your obligation to do that the best of your ability. Right. That doesn't mean you have to stay with the first job you take the oh, rest no, of your life. No, that's right. You can leave and better yourself, but while you're there, you got to work uh, as though Christ is watching you, because He that's is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do Amen. honest work and that sort of thing. Amen, brother. Now, if you're a master, if you're an employee, employer, if you own right. the company, if you're a supervisor at work, uh, do the same. Work as though you're working for Christ. Right. Um, don't threaten and be harsh and be overly critical to your employees. Nothing right. burns out of work or more than to, to be criticized constantly. Be, oh, live in man. fear of being disciplined when they work. Right. Being fear of being written up. Uh, living in constant fear of the crushing weight of their supervisor. Uh, encourage them. Don't, right. don't be a slave master that drives them, but right. lead by example. Amen. And that's important. That's important if you're a master to understand that. Now, Paul does not advocate for the liberation of all slaves in the first century. Mm-hmm. And we're going to look at this in our next study to come. We're going to look at uh, um, what is the, the topic? Ethics. Uh, ethics. Christian ethics. And we're going to look at slavery 
in the next topic to come. And and, and one of the subjects will I think two parts will be on Christian will be in slavery mm -hmm. and how Christianity does not seek to liberate all slaves in the Roman Empire. But when Paul meets a runaway slave named Onesimus in the first century, we've got a book called Philemon in, in, in our Bibles, a little tiny single oh, yeah. 16 verses, I think, in this book. He sends him back to his master, he sends Onesimus back to his master with the instructions to free him, treat him uh, impartially, right? Christianity does liberate slaves. Yes. And if the Bible is understood correctly, um, it, it, it can be used to uh, justify the liberation of, of slavery, abolishment, right. abolition of slaves. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, where Christianity is practiced, uh, slavery dissolves. Yeah. It's just as simple as that. We had to learn that lesson in our country. It took right. us uh, 150 years, approximately. Well, yeah. eight, I mean, 80 years from the time of the Declaration of Independence to the time of the Civil War, 80 years approximately. But we had slaves before that in this country. It, it took us a while to learn that. It took us a while. And now it'd be hard pressed to meet anybody that believes that slavery <laughs> should, right. be, should be legalized. Right. Well, that's, that's some of that uh, mustard seed growing. That's some of that leaven in the lump leavening, right? right? Working itself in. That's Christianity affecting a culture. Right. And the liberation of slaves... It, it, now, the idea of slaves being liberated, right, is so permeates our culture. We can't imagine a, a culture which slavery is acceptable. Right. Okay, so how are employees to, and employers to live for Christ? Do their job as if they are working for Christ, whether you're the employee or the employer. That's right. Christ might not sign your check, but he owns the company you right. work for. The vocations of Christians differ. However, the calling is the Amen. same. And let's That's look right. at the calling here. All right, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All right, now Peter is addressing the scattered Christians, the, dis, the, the diaspora of Christians right. across Asia Minor, it's who his, his target audience is. Probably Jewish believers, Jewish right. converts Christianity who have been scattered and displaced as, uh, you know, on the very, uh, on the, I guess, the verge of the, the uh, persecution of Christians by the, by the, uh, by the Judaizers uh, during that right. time period. They've been scattered to some degree. And Peter's writing to those folks. Anyway, may, maybe uh, I mean there's there's some discussion about who the diaspora Peter's writing to. It could be Jew it's it's Christians for sure, but po most likely Jewish Christians. Yeah, most likely, I agree. Now, one of the things that the Reformation did, thankfully, is to say we don't need a pope. Right. We don't need a priest. Right. Because we have a priest. We have a priest who is in Christ. Amen. He's a great Amen. advocate or high Amen. priest. And one of the things that Martin Luther said was that the Reformation did not seek to abolish the priesthood, but it sought to make every man a priest. Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> so while we don't have an earthly priest as office over us, because that's an old covenant trapping, mm -hmm. we have a function of the priest. Right. And under the old covenant, the function of the priest was to intercede for other people. Now, the, right. the function of the prophet was to be a mouthpiece for God, to speak from heaven downward to men. But the function of the priest was to speak from men up to God, to advocate, to be the intercessor mm -hmm. between men and God. Paul says, you're a chosen race, speaking to Christians. You're a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood of intercessors, right? A people of, of God's own possession, who've been called from dark to light. Right. Um, you once were not his people, even though right. you probably were ethnic Jews, but now you're actually God's people. Right. Uh, you've received mercy. Uh, you didn't receive mercy before, now you've received mercy. So it's our job to sort of pass this along. Amen. So whatever job you have in life, and it doesn't matter if you're the dishwasher or if you own the restaurant. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the company or if you're entry level first day on the job. Amen. Whatever job you may have in this life, whatever vocation it is, it is all a holy calling. That's right. How, according to Peter, what did God call us from? What did he call darkness. Us? He called us out of darkness. And what did he call us to? To proclaim his excellencies. And this can be done wherever you work. Wherever you are. And that's the thing. Every, every Work is holy. All work for the Christian is holy. Whatever work it is, wherever it takes place. And you have Christians that, you know, I wish God would speak from heaven, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And this is what we're looking at here. At the, at the end of a study on eschatology, this grounds us into being faithful, 
not whittling away the time trying to figure out when Christ is going to return. Believe me, if he returns in your lifetime, you'll know it. But rather to live focused on our high calling in Christ to be his light and salt in this world. Amen. I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it goes to the effect, it, something like this. Uh, a rabbi was once asked, if the world ended tomorrow, what would you, what would you do today? He said, I, pl I would plant a tree. <laughs> Meaning that whatever he's doing now, he would just do it because he's doing what God's called him to do. Right. Right, and that's that's true for you and I. Whatever you're doing now, that's what God has called you to do. Right. It's not that you can't switch vocations, but whatever earth, whatever secular vocation you have, is all been is all sanctified because you're doing it for Christ. Amen. So keep doing it. Don't worry about Christ's return. Be prepared for it. Repent right. of your sins. Know Christ is your Savior. Make peace with Him on right. His terms, and then go sell used cars. Right. I mean that's that's the mission field is the world, and uh, we don't. I mean, the church does support missionaries all over the world, mm -hmm. local, but the church is, in a sense, all missionaries because wherever we go and whatever we do, we are Christ people, His disciples, uh, spreading the salt on a, a culture that needs pre pre preservation and certainly shining the light of the gospel into dark places. And when you work in the world as a Christian, your employer, who may be secular, is actually paying you to be a missionary. <laughs> oh, that's real good. Look at that. And you can share Christ any job. That's right. Uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What are Christians called to do into the end of the age? Make disciples. Yeah, the end of the aeon, we're to keep doing what we're doing. Right. That's, that's the focus. It's not when the end will come and trying to understand uh, all these prophecies that uh, these prophecy gurus throw out at us. Uh, some people in the church, and every church has one or two, someone that's just, they're just all about end times. They're mm -hmm. just fanatical about it. And that's all they think. That's all they talk about. They just live and breathe the end times. And that's an unhealthy balance. Mm -hmm. It's not a balance. It's an out of balance. Your focus <laughs> right. is to be fulfilling the Great Commission. Yeah. They're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly Yeah, good. exactly right. So we're called, we're, Christ left us here. He called us yeah. here. And I believe uh, the Great Commission, if uh, I, I believe the Greek wording of this is uh, as you go. Right. Not go therefore, but as you're going, right. make disciples. Implied yep. in this command is as you're selling cars, win folks to Christ. Yep. As you're the butcher at the local grocery store, win folks to Christ. As you are doing what you do, carry out the Great Commission. That's it. That's it's, it. It's pretty simple. Right. Don't. A lot of folks fall into the trap of, well, you know, when I get to this point in my life, then I'll be a better witness. And then, you know, if God can open this door for me and I finally make it to wherever, then I'll be more apt to be a better disciple of Christ. No, that's not, that's not how it works. As we go, where, wherever you are in your faith, wherever you are in life, wherever you work, that you're, you're a Great Commission Christian. Yeah. The world is your mission field. Amen. The place where you might sell car insurance. Yeah. That is a mission field yeah. for you. Sometimes it's the home. Yep. If you're a mother and you're at home, uh, your mission field obviously is your home and we've got to be faithful to Christ and, and and something that you know these end time fanatics do is they make eschatology the dividing line whether or not you're saved mm. and that's sad because this is something that we can discuss and debate and disagree with each other but that doesn't mean we have to sever fellowship with our believers over over end times uh, t teachings not a single creed of the Christian ancient world included in it uh, 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 an eschatology right. uh, that was this say this is how you should yeah. believe these things about Christ's second coming because to them it was just Christ comes and yeah. that would be why, and it? that's where that's where all orthodox Christians come down on is that Christ will return ah the Westminster Shorter Catechism the question number one in the Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's right. We were made to worship. Right. Now, we were made to worship God, and with the fall of Adam, we worship other things. Right. But if you've been redeemed and restored and brought back to Christ, been a new creation in Christ, then now your chief purpose is to not worship the things of the world, but to worship God Himself. That's right. And... 
enjoy him. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Enjoy him forever. Yeah. Starts now and goes on forever. <laughs> so if anybody ever asks you, you know, this is according to, this is not scripture, but this is, um, this is from scripture. So right. The answer is derived right. from scripture, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What's my purpose, man? What am I on earth to do? Right. I say, well, you know, your job is to glorify God. Enjoy right. forever. Now, those who die apart from Christ and enter the fire pits of hell and the judgment of God, the wrath of God, they are bringing glory to God because they're magnifying His justice. That's right. But if you're a Christian, it's not just to glorify God, but it's to enjoy Him forever. Amen. Yes, that's heavenly. Purpose, purpose of man? Glorify God. And enjoy Him. And enjoy Him forever. First Peter 3.15 But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope, for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it, do this, uh, do it with gentleness and respect. I'll get it out. Don't worry. So be prepared. When right. someone asks you, you know, right. their hope, their calling, their purpose, those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, somebody, somebody walks up to you, you know, and they say, "What, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on on the end of the world?" You know, and you, you probably need to fill them out a little bit, find out where they're coming from, and all that. But, you know. What people need to hear is not somebody's eschatological uh, theory or understanding. Although that's important, take them to Christ. Mm -hmm. Point them to Christ. And then talk about when Christ will return. But again, don't make it a point of, of contention and strife between believers, certainly, because that's not the point of eschatology, is to give us hope. Yeah, there's an ocean of people out there who are wandering aimlessly and, and without any hope. They're in despair. They don't know what life is all about, what, what brings them true peace. And Peter says... Be ready. Be prepared. Yep. Do we ask you for the reason for the hope that you have? Be tell ready them. to tell them. Live it and speak it. Got to do both, mostly. You know, I mean, the gospel has to be heard, but uh, you certainly live out Christ all the time. Amen. Last question. Put a bow on this thing. Right. Jerry, where do we go from here? Well, I tell you. Uh, somebody, you know, has watched all of this and, and comes to the end here, and it's like, you didn't really talk about eschatology that much. Well, what's so good about, I think, what's so good about this concluding study, this last study, is that it, again, grounds us in what we need to be doing in the between times between the first and second comings of Christ. And that is to live for Him, to glorify Him, and to enjoy Him, whatever it is, wherever you live, whatever situation God has put you in, um, that's, that's where we go. We don't, we don't go... Well, I don't know, man. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta figure out when Christ is coming back. I can't go to sleep until I figure this thing out. All right. Don't worry Stress about that. Over it. He's coming. You'll be all right. Where do you go from here? I thought you were gonna say Morton's Gap. Well, you know, when I leave here, I will go to Morton's Gap. But <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the 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 young man who graduates high school. They said, "Okay, what are you gonna do now? You finish high school?" I said, "I'm going to make a sandwich." <laughs> yeah, you know, going to Disney World. <laughs> I'm going to Disney. Well, whatever, you, whatever you do in life, as long as it doesn't dishonor God, Amen. it's your calling, your vocation, right. and, and live it out. Amen. Live it out. We appreciate you guys sticking this out. If you've been here all 50 parts, Ooh. you probably get a star in your crown. Yes. You get the, the crown of endurance or whatever. Yes, yes. Next time we get together, we'll be looking at Christian ethics. Yep. And so we'll be looking at a variety of topics from um, the right to own guns, the right. obligation to employers, uh, slavery, uh, abortion. Right. Goodness, uh, it's been a few weeks since I looked at this, but it's uh, right. quite a few topics. Quite a few topics. So, I, again, I won't tell you how to think. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say you got to think exactly what I do, but I want to present a biblical model for developing Christian ethics. Right. And this, this study will help you live out where do we go from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it won't be my opinion on just saying you ought to do this and that. You ought to be right. pro-life. I'm just going to say here's what the Bible says, and I'm going to if I've got to anchor myself to to a source of truth, it's got to be the Scripture. Right. If you if you're going to go out and live for Christ, then you got to understand uh, the Word of God, because you're not going to glorify Christ in a fallen culture by get going along with a fallen culture. You 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 may make enemies along the way, speaking the truth in love. But if you are to be salt and light, then you have to be obedient. And this study on Christian ethics will help you understand uh, what obedience might look like in particular situations and, and, and cultural settings. That's right. How many parts is it? I've forgotten. I, I forgot. I looked and I read through it all, but I don't remember how many parts. I think it's all the parts. That's They're all there, I believe. Uh, 18 parts. 18 parts. That's nothing compared to what we've done here. So the next study dovetails with this. Where do you go from here? Yeah, I We're think gonna it help does. You I think it does. Tell you how to live out your life. Amen. Amen. 
Well, Jerry, you do you honor to close this out? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to have been able to study about eschatology, your plan and, and what you have determined to come to pass and in your time. And Father, it, it gives us hope because it shows us that you're in control and that Christ will return. And Father, help us to live out our faith each day until you come or death takes us to you so that we can glorify you and to enjoy you now and to enjoy you forever. Father, be with us as we turn the page here and look at ethics. Help us to live as Christians in this world, to honor you with the way we live. Help us to have our minds renewed by the Word of God. And Father, we turn our attention to prayer needs in our churches and in our families and our own homes. And we lift all these concerns up to you. Father, be with us. Be with your people. Make us salt and light. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. See you guys next week. Same bat time. Yes, yeah, same bat channel. See you.